Perfect. Okay. So welcome everyone um, to lecture number three. I hope everyone's handling this uh, remote situation all right. Um, and we're going to go ahead and talk some about uh, web development and, and CSS. So uh, every day we're going to start off with some admin uh, administrative via and reminders. And uh, then we'll go into some terminology review and talk a lot about cascading style sheets. So a couple of reminders and notes. Um, Creative Project One is out now and due sometime next week. Um, please ask questions for help. Um, if you have them, um, we have multiple opportunities to ask for help. We have Ed, the discussion board. We have uh, office hours with myself and Andrew uh, after lecture every Monday, Wednesday, Friday. Um, more details on the timing uh, for that are in the WPL page uh, linked here which is also your opportunity to ask questions of TAs uh, who can help out with all sorts of things. Um, one minor note on the uh, lecture recordings. I know uh, Wednesday's recording was a little bit delayed. Um, it was stuck in this weird approval loop where it asked for approval, I approved it, and then it went back to asking for approval and it was locked. So I apologize for that. Um, we'll try to make sure that this one does not end up in that same uh, situation, um, but uh, we'll handle it if it does. Um, speaking of lecture, I also want to um, propose something that uh, we might look at um, alternative ways of delivering uh, lecture and content. Um, I, I know uh, from the last two lectures, our first two lectures, that we spent a fair bit of time addressing questions and not necessarily getting to new content. Um, and so, for example, a lot of section yesterday was spent on, on CSS and selectors that we didn't cover in lecture very much at all. Um, and so uh, since lecture uh, does spend a lot of time on questions, and that's fine, that's good. I'm glad you are asking questions. I'm glad everyone is willing to uh, contribute and participate in lecture this way. We, we have this technology that, that we don't normally have in, in lecture hall to uh, ask questions asynchronously. And that's really nice. And I really like having your questions. Um, but we do want to make sure we get to content as well. So we're considering um, exploring other ways for getting you new content. Um, and so uh, one option for that would be to uh, publish and, um, and send you links for these short little like five to 10 minutes videos uh, exploring specific topics. Um, and then we can uh, reserve lecture for, uh, for more discussion and, um, and more open-ended uh, activities that way. This is something we're considering. Um, uh, for right now, it's still going to be the same as what we've done the, the, for this whole week, um, but I just wanted to put it out there that it's something we are considering doing. Okay. So we're going to start off with a poll everywhere, a couple questions. Um, and so as usual, go to pollev.com slash fits, and I'm going to go ahead and activate this um, and full screen. So our, our first question uh, for you today, what is the right HTML to use for big text? How many people? We have 200 people here, so we'll wait for approximately that. Um, so we're getting really good response on uh, option number letter C, um, with some people spreading out a little bit on, on other options. Um, so, and it looks like folks are, are coalescing on, on letter C uh, from the other letters as well. And yeah, it, for, for HTML, um, it really does depend um, when you want to use big text, uh, what your situation is relative to everything else. Um, we don't always want to use 
H1 or H2 uh, for just the size of the text because those mean that um, this is a, a header of level one and a header of level two. And so if you think of in terms of like a document outline or, um, or a book where we have chapters and sections, um, H1 and H2 are providing the, that meaning of this is chapter one of unit number one. Um, and so that might be H2 and H1 respectively. Um, we don't want to use it for sizing. Um, and instead we want to uh, look at um, you know, what does the size mean relative to everything else and style it with CSS potentially. So short answer is it really does depend on what your situation is for how you want to style and make big text. Um, so then our next question, what does a CSS selector do? We kind of covered this in section yesterday and we kind of covered it in lecture on Wednesday. Um, I'll give a moment for people to come together. All right, looks like we've settled on option B. Uh, yes, so we'll cover more about this today in terms of what a selector is and what kinds of selectors there are. But fundamentally, yeah, it, it is telling us which HTML elements and which parts of the page the style is applying to. Um, and so th this is our, we'll, we'll explore different ways on selecting groups of, um, groups of HTML elements, but um, but yes. So I saw a hand go up, Jeremy. Yeah, um, is there a word for the, like like what comes after the selector is like within the brackets, is that called like the body or something? Yes, so uh, we're gonna cover that in a slide or two. So hang on for a moment. Um, but there, yeah, there is terminology that we, we can cover for that. Um, uh, give me a moment to, okay, there we go. So um, speaking of terminology, um, I do want to cover real briefly um, some of these things because there are, there, there are tags, there are selectors, there are properties, there are rules, there are attributes. There's all these different things, um, all these new words that we're throwing around. And I want to spend a moment to review what, um, review some of those things. So when we look at our website right now, we have two tools available to us. We have HTML, which is the things in their meaning, uh, like our words and our images and our content. Um, and whether they are links, whether they are emphasized, um, whether they're headings, as I discussed earlier. Um, and then we have, this, have CSS, the way things look. And so when we look at an HTML tag, we have a couple of examples where um, every HTML tag for the most part has an opening and a closing. In this first example, we have a paragraph, uh, which is represented by the P tag because in computer science, we like to shorten everything. And so why not take paragraph and just cut off everything but the first letter? Um, so we have our opening, we have our closing, and between the two, we have the content that we want to have the meaning of being a paragraph. Within HTML tags, we can also have attributes which provide additional data about the thing. So for example, we have a, a link which is represented by the A tag, which is short for anchor. Um, in this attribute, uh, we are specifying what the link actually points to. And then finally, we have some uh, HTML tags that don't need a closing tag at all because all of the information, including the content, is contained within the attributes. So for example, an image. For CSS, and this is getting to your question, Jeremy, um, uh, we also have these, these various different parts and these, these various uh, things that we, that we use. We already talked about the selector in the sense that this is the thing that tells us which parts of the page the style applies to. Um, within that, we have a list of properties. 
And so uh, between the curly braces is our, is our declaration of the style for the selected HTML elements. And uh, the declaration is made up of a series of properties which have the name of the property and the value of the property. So in this case, the property we want to change is the color and set it to red. Does that answer your question, Jeremy? Yeah. Perfect. Good. Um, and so we're going to spend most of today talking about uh, CSS and cascading style sheets. Um, so as we as we found out from Poll Everywhere, yes, selectors are the thing that designate exactly which elements to apply the style to. We can be very generic with them, or we can be very specific with those selectors, and we'll see how those how those play out. Um, we have our properties, which define what we're changing. And there are a lot of these properties. And you won't really be expected to memorize all of them because there's, as I said, a lot of them. Um, and uh, But do take some time to, to play around with them and see what things are available. Um, and if you want um, some guidance on that, the Chrome Inspector tool is an interesting tool for trying out and, and auto-completing some potential styles. Uh, so for example, if I pull up the, uh, the tool here, we can go into the elements tab and um, using this uh, select an element button, I can go in and choose a specific part of the page. And within that, let's say I have the paragraph tag, oops. And this looks very much like the uh, CSS that we saw in, oh, I can't change that one, uh, in the, the slides. And when I start typing on any one of these properties, you can see that the Chrome inspector will give us a list of all of the potential options that we have for uh, CSS rules that happen to start with margin. Um, and we can type almost anything and it'll give us some suggestions. Uh, so this tool, which we'll see more of throughout the quarter, is a great opportunity to, to explore around and see what kinds of styles and what kinds of rules you can apply to various tags. So when you're looking around um, on the internet for how do I do the style for this particular part of this particular site, um, you're going to find a lot of resources that are either good or bad. Um, and so taking a moment to, to address that, um, there are answers to almost every question about web development, including HTML and CSS. Um, but instead of just copying and pasting the answer, um, which is very tempting to do, especially when the deadline for an assignment is coming up close. Um, take a moment to understand why that thing is the answer. Um, there are some uh, solutions out there that are either very old and have been replaced by better techniques or um, aren't very good style. And so what I mean by that is, uh, as you've seen potentially, there is we have a course code style guide um, on the web page. So if we go to the web page and check out the resources tab, uh, you can see the CSE 154 code quality guide. So we have recommendations here on what it means to write good HTML and good CSS. And we expect that these rules are followed for uh, the majority of the quarter. And there are answers on the internet that don't follow good style guide, whether it's ours or otherwise. And so when you find an example um, on the internet, um, that's OK. Just take a moment to see how does it apply to your scenario? Why does it work? And does it fit our code quality guide? Um, and by doing that, by going through that, it'll help you understand the core concepts much, much better and, and much more deeply. Um, and uh, that will also eventually help you navigate how many, re all of the different resources that are available online. Um, 
as, as you know, the internet is large and there are many options. Um, so taking some time, um, it doesn't take much, but taking a little bit of time to, to think through what, what the answer is uh, and, and how it applies will help uh, in the future. Um, ultimately, um, sometimes you, you might end up looking at and referencing a resource. Um, all of the work that you do, no matter where it comes from, must be your own. Um, and so if you borrow from a tutorial, borrow from a resource, maybe change it to be your own, um, cite it uh, to make sure that we know where it came from, um, especially in, in, in the creative projects where it's a little bit more open-ended in terms of what you do and what it looks like. Um, for, for homeworks and, and obviously exams, we expect it to be almost entirely your own. So um, make sure that, uh, that you cite things where, where appropriate. Okay, back to cascading style sheets. Um, and so the cascade part of this is, is looking at this, this notion of being able to apply multiple styles um, to a single thing. And we don't have to specify all of these styles in the exact same, uh, same declaration. Um, we could end up with very large declarations or very specific um, selectors. Or we could have general general selectors that um, progressively get more specific as we we want things to get more specific. For example, we might say that the entirety of our web page, so the body of our page, has a certain font. But um, uh, maybe so we want the body to have a certain font and a certain size. Okay, that's going to apply to all, all elements across the entire page. If we want, say, the header or the, the H1 tag to have a different size, we would give a different rule, but it will still follow the same font. And so we get this cascading of inheritance down our, um, our, our list of elements um, when we look at how to apply which thing. Uh, and we'll, we'll see a, uh, an example here in a moment. Um, this tends to then get a little bit complicated in where you have potentially multiple CSS files. So um, when we introduced CSS, we saw that in the head tag, you added a link href something.css uh, tag, and that told the browser where the CSS file is, where the rules for the, for the style come from. You can add multiples of those. You can have multiple link tags. Um, and what'll happen is the browser applies those in order. It starts on the first one, applies all the rules, and then goes to the second one. And if there are any that are uh, new or overriding, it's going to usually apply from the second one. And it depends on how those selectors play out. And part of what that looks like, this is, um, Jeremy, you have a question. Yes, um, you said it, it like starts with one and goes to the next. Mm -hmm. is that by, um, is that by like some arbit, like what's what's the order determined by? Because it seems like the last one is very important. Is it determined by like um, alphabetical order, like when the file was written or what? Yeah, it, it applies based on the order of where they appear in the HTML document. Oh, OK. Um, and so at the top of your .html, in the head tag, you had those the, the link tag to, to indicate where the CSS file is. The order of that in the HTML source is how they are applied. Got it. OK, thanks. Yep. And so when we're, when we're talking about selectors um, in the CSS, we often reference uh, this hierarchy of different elements across the, the page. And when we reference that hierarchy, we're, we're actually referencing something called the document object model. And this was going to come up multiple times over the next couple of weeks. The document object model is a representation of your HTML page. And so here on the slide on the left, you have a simple HTML. Um, 
is a set of, of tags where we have some that are children of the, of the others. And when the browser looks at that HTML, it builds up this tree that you can see on the right. And it's saying at the very top, we have this, um, we have a div and that div has two children uh, elements. Both of those happen to be divs and each one of those also has three of their own. And so we have this tree of things. Um, and that means that each one of our elements is a node on the tree and can be accessed based on the relationship between um, uh, it and its parent or its children. And we'll return to this, uh, as I said, repeatedly. Um, but this is something we want to keep in mind for, for how our CSS selectors apply. And so there's a couple different kinds of selectors uh, that we have. There are the, the simple selectors um, and, and groupings, which uh, apply to a specific tag or a spe uh, even a specific element within the page. Uh, and then we get a little bit more complicated when we get into uh, combining uh, different elements and combining different tags. Um, and then uh, we'll talk real briefly about uh, something called pseudo selectors. When we talk about the simple selectors, um, we have an ID and a class as, as a couple of the elements that we, or a couple of the selectors that we can use. Um, an ID is a thing that can only appear once per page. And that allows us to say, I want this specific thing on the page to be styled a specific way. The class meanwhile is saying, I want this group of things to all have the same style always. Um, and so you can have many elements that have the same class, but you can only have one element that has the same ID. And I know this was covered yesterday a bit, so I'll move on. Um, so our simple selectors really fall into three different categories. We have the classes and the IDs that we can apply. And then we have a specific element. Um, so for example, here, the paragraph element. Um, sometimes around the internet, um, uh, especially when you're looking on Stack Overflow or other places, you might see the star selector or the asterisk selector. We generally don't like that particular selector um, in, in most part because um, it's kind of like, if you remember from uh, most introduction to programming co courses, um, 142, 143, for example, talk about this notion of global variables and how we don't really like global variables for a variety of reasons. The star selector is pretty similar in, in that it applies to everything and, and, and that ends up being bad style um, because when it applies to everything, we don't really have a notion of, um, of cascading and inheritance and making sure that only certain parts of the, the um, page are styled in certain ways. And so, especially for this course, um, we are going to be enforcing that uh, we don't use the star selector um, except when it's in combination with other things because we want your selectors, selectors to be as specific as possible. Um, Alex has a question. So what about the HTML ID selector? That also selects everything on the page, but is that also bad style? So what do you mean by the HTML ID selector? Sorry, the HTML uh, tag. On the MDN reference, it said you might want to set the font for the default font for HTML to a certain type to make sizing easier. But would that be bad style because you're applying to everything? Right, that's a good question. So um, there, so the, the star applies to literally everything on the page, no matter where in, the, in that DOM hierarchy it appears. The HTML tag, so if you use the HTML selector or the body selector, which sometimes we, we will see, it's kind of equivalent, as, as you've noted, um, because it applies to everything eventually. Um, but uh, we still get some nice inheritance there, because it's applying to the top of the tree, 
and then um, subsequent children can override that. Um, and it's a much nicer uh, from a style uh, code quality standpoint to you to do that rather than saying just everything has this style and I'll worry about you know making sure that the order of my CSS rules is such that they override where appropriate. We want to rely on that that inheritance based on the DOM tree more so than the order of um, how how the rules apply. Um, the, the rules uh, can be overwritten by children, but it, again, because of that, that star um, is applying to every single tag, the, the inheritance rules aren't quite clear. Um, and so that's where we wanna uh, use that DOM tree relationship um, rather than saying just everything has this particular style. Um, Okay. So just a quick example. I know we've seen some of these all already, um, but this is a particular example of saying, um, and this is the most specific one I can get for this one because I'm, particular, I'm saying in this particular CSS rule that I want the background of my entire page to be this particular color. And so, can't get more specific on this because that's the only way to apply that particular rule. When we look at uh, combinator selectors, these are selectors that are looking at, um, again, that relationship between things uh, in that DOM tree. And so there's two uh, examples here. One is where we have that greater than symbol and one where we don't. Um, the, so the selector of A, B, if we go back to our, our graph here, if I said um, ID, or if I selected the ID of container and then had a space with um, div, it's going to say, that all of the divs that are somewhere beneath the container div will have this particular style. Um, whereas if we add the greater than symbol, we're just saying the first level in that tree after the thing, the A in this, in this particular slide. So if we go back to this, this diagram, if I said ID container, and then greater than uh, div, we would only select these first two divs underneath the top one. So we'll say that again. Um, the first combinator is, um, would select all of the divs underneath A, even if it's two levels below, whereas the second one will only select one level below. Okay. Um, whoops. And then we, when we get into pseudo classes, these pseudo selectors, these are um, uh, getting into a little bit of um, attributes of, of elements in some ways, um, as well as uh, specifically um, specifically addressing certain nodes within that DOM tree. For example, we have our first child and our nth child pseudo selectors, which are looking at, um, when we look, look at that DOM tree and we're getting all of the children of one of those elements, we can say, I only want to do some of the children of those elements. Like in this case, the CSS selector of uh, the UL list item nth child. This is saying that um, for the list item elements underneath the UL tag, every other one apply a particular style. And if we open up the code pen, 
we can see this happening in uh, in actuality. Um, and does this apply immediately? It does. Great. Um, so here we're saying that 2n. So when we say the nth child, we are essentially saying that each one of these children has a, a number associated with them uh, in, in the sense that this one is the first child and then the second child and then the third child, et cetera, down. And so when we say, when we provide 2n here within the parentheses, we're saying that um, the uh, the even children, so the, the children that, um, that, that have that applied, that are even, you know, the second child, the fourth child, because it's 2n, um, and then this one will give you the odd children. Nth children does only apply to the direct children. And yeah, in this particular case, we could just leave off the UL because um, there's there's only uh, list items under UL in, the, in this particular case. Um, if we had a different case, so we could add, for example, a second list here, make this an ordered list. So now we have two different lists. One is a uh, unordered list, one is an ordered list. And so if we just had li colon nth child um, for the even ones, then it's going to apply to both different kinds of, of lists. But if we only want that every other coloring to apply to the unordered list, we'll have to do the UL. OK, we've kind of addressed some questions in line, but I do want to consciously pause for if there are questions. What if we want exactly the first element to apply? Oops, I don't want to save. Um, do this because of that cascading effect. So when you provide an n at in, in within the parameter for the nth child, um, that's doing some math there to, for you to um, to figure out which number it is. But if you just specify a number, and yeah, it starts at one rather than, you know, normally we say that everything in computer science starts with zero. Uh, the CSS rules are slightly different and that I do start with one. Um, so you can specify a specific number here um, for which one uh, you want to do. If you have um, a zero, you just get nothing because there is no zeroth child of the uh, of the UL. If you wanted to, if you had two unordered lists, um, the it you'd either want to style them all the same. So having all of your unordered lists have this notion of the every ordered, every other color. Let me put that back to that, and then change this to a UL. So you either want to have all of your unordered lists be styled that way, or you'd want to specify an ID or uh, some kind of class to differentiate the two. So I might say that maybe this unordered list, this first unordered list is of, it's a, a class of um, striped items. And so then here, what I want to say is that um, just the unordered lists with the striped class are going to have these rules applied. Um, Lauren has a question on, would that example be better to use a pseudo class or an ID? Uh, which example were you referring to and kind of covered a couple before uh, I got to your question? The one where you only wanted to highlight one of the lines. Okay, so in the case where I uh, changed that 2n to a, a 1, well, when I also had this commented out. Yeah. 
Yeah, so in in this case, um, you know, using nth child is is probably the right way to do that because um, when you're trying to use the the combinators or um, for example, because we could use like one of those rules or we could use use something like that. Um, but if we did this rule where we have ul greater than li, that's going to reply apply to all of the children of all of the direct children of the ul element. And so if we want to apply it only to that first ch child, then we have to use the nth child uh, pseudo class. Um, you could use an I ID, um, but again, then that's only going to apply to that one element in the entire page. Um, so an ID, you can only have one of per entire page. And so if you had multiple lists where you, for every single list, you wanted to have the first item colored a certain way, then you're going to have to use the pseudo class. If you genuinely want just that particular element and nothing else styled a particular way, then yes, you would use ID. Um, so it, it does it depends a little bit on what your goal is for, for styling the page. Um, Justin has a question on variables in CSS. Um, we're not really going to address variables in CSS uh, here. Um, we're, we're going to, for the most part, uh, work with types of styles and types of ways of styling that um, don't need variables at all. Um, and so um, we'll, we'll probably not address that. Um, and so hold on to that uh, for, for a future lecture. Um, I'll do a couple more and then we'll move on. Um, Nikhil has a question, how does 2n plus 1 color the first in the list since there's no 0? How would it ever reach the first element? Um, so this is where it gets a little confusing, right? Because uh, in computer science, everything starts with 0. So the n here is 0 ordered. Um, and so when we do 2n, that's taking uh, 0 as the um, the first element, and then saying um, two times zero is zero. There is no zeroth element, but then we do one, one times uh, one times two is is two. So the second element is going to apply there. Um, and so we do our math based on um, based on zero, but the elements actual numbers are are one. Um, so just to recap that, when we do our math for figuring out this, this n here in the 2n, it is zero based. But then when we apply that to uh, the actual order of which child it applies to, it's one based. Um, the next question, is it a good style here to add a class equals back green to all list items when we want to change the background color instead of using a pseudo selector? Um, so if, if you find yourself adding uh, the same class to a bunch of different elements, like I could add these in and say that, yeah, I want all of these items to be green, or I just want these particular items to be green um, and, and write the appropriate CSS rule for that. But just like in, in other, other courses, and we'll, we'll talk a little bit more about this throughout this course, we want to try to reduce redundancy where we can. And um, by doing that, we increase our maintainability. And so what I mean by that is um, if I have all of these elements that have various um, classes and I want to make sure that the, every other one is, is green, and then let's say I go in and add more elements to the list. And I'm trying to just focus on the content of my page. So I want to add more elements. I want to add more items into this list. But now if I want every other one to be green, I'm going to have to go in and copy and paste this into each one of my elements. 
that makes it hard to maintain and hard to um, hard to figure out uh, what I need to change and what I need to update to make sure that I maintain that every other one is green. And so what we'll want to look for is um, how can you replicate uh, this effect of having every other item have this green class with a particular CSS rule that's just going to be automatic for us. Um, Why is it, I'm going to do one more question, then move on. Um, why is it ul.striped li instead of just.striped nth child? Um, that's just because it's what I typed here. Um, uh, but doing it ul.striped, um, as I mentioned earlier, we want our rules to be as specific as we can to apply the thing that we want. So in a real page, I, I might have other elements that have the striped class. Um, but in this particular case, I want the list items under the uh, unordered list to be striped in a different way than other striped class elements. Um, so again, I could change this to a ordered list and have it be a of class striped. Um, but I want the ordered list striping colors to be a little bit different color than the unordered list striped colors. So they're both striped, but I might want the children to be colored differently. Okay. Um, great questions. Thank you so much for, um, for adding those questions. Um, if we didn't get to yours, if, if I didn't get to yours, um, I apologize. We'll try to get the, to them in, in chat or after we finish up here. Um, so the last thing I want to talk about today before we, before we break, and we are getting close to time, is I want to briefly introduce the idea of using CSS to, to lay things out. And what I mean by that, kind of indicated by, by this comic, um, CSS is how, what we use to change how things look on the website. Um, you can kind of get some of that in some ways with HTML based on how, um, how the different elements behave. But for the most part, we're going to use CSS to, to position and move things around on, on the page. And this can sometimes be a little bit tricky. And th that's partially because there's multiple techniques for how you're going to lay things out across the, the website. Um, and so we'll address a couple of them here uh, in the next couple of days. The first thing uh, is that there's this idea of block versus inline elements. And that's um, a fundamental part of, of HTML rather than CSS. And um, we briefly addressed this on, on, uh, er, in an earlier lecture. And you can see in this example that we have a couple different tags. We have a paragraph tag and a strong tag nested within it. In this example, the paragraph tag is a block element and the strong tag is an inline tag. And so with this coloring, uh, of the, the different tags, you can see um, kind of some of the effect that is happening here, where the paragraph tag, which we've styled to be uh, this light blue, takes up the entire width of whatever parent element it's, it's part of. Um, meanwhile, the strong tag um, is only taking up as much width as it needs to fill whatever content it, ha it has. Um, so this is one uh, really easy way to, to get some notions of layout um, because we could start to change the, the width and the height of, of both of these. And so um, you could change the width of your P tag to get um, that, that blue box to only go so far, um, or you could change it to be a little bit higher and have it take up a little bit more space. And so, uh, with these basic width and height rules, um, depending on whether it's applied to a block element or an inline element, you can get um, you can get a little bit of of moving things around. But you'll notice we still don't have 
um, uh, the, the green paragraph next to the light blue paragraph. They're still vertically aligned, um, one after each other uh, in, in a, a top-down layout. So we, we can um, try to play around a little bit more with it. Um, you know, we, we can increase the, the size of the, the inline element. Um, that doesn't change anything about the paragraph tag that it's part of, and it doesn't change anything about the other tag. Um, and I'll get to the side-by-side -side in a moment. Um, width and height are, are tags that you can use to change the width and height, change the size. Um, you can see, you can do it in pixels. You can do it in percentages. Um, the percentages are, are largely going to be based on the, the size of things around it. Um, so you can see here, the, uh, the light blue block we've specified as, as an 80% width. And what that's saying is that I want this block, this paragraph block, to be 80% of the size of the parent that it's within. And I'm going to inspect this page, and hopefully it looks OK. Um, so this paragraph is the child of this this div element. Um, and when we say that its width is 80%, we are now making it 80% of its parent. Okay. You can also specify it in terms of number of pixels, uh, which we've specified here. Um, but that kind of um, uh, reduces how much the page can be be responsive to different uh, browser sizes and different browser pages. Um, not everyone's screen is the same size. I have mine like this. And if I shrink it down, it, it changes um, uh, how big things are and where things are, are, are laid out. And part of this is done with metric with units like uh, percentages rather than pixels. If I said that the width was Definitely 100 pixels every single time, no matter what. That's where scroll bars start to come in and where things start running off the edge of the page and you can't see things. So generally, we're going to see percentages rather than pixels. And something that'll come up um, when we look at this, this basic layout of things with CSS is something called the box model. And um, so if we. Oh, that one's not available. I'll open up this one. Make this bigger. And there it is. Um, our, our box model is going to help us define um, how much space something takes up. And that uh, has a direct impact on where things appear on the, the page. And when we reference the box model, we're really saying that there are, there are four different aspects um, of every element. We have the actual size it takes up, which is this middle section. We have how much space is between the content of that element and its edge. And that's what we're going to call our padding. And then we have the edge itself, which is what we call border. And then there's an extra bit of space outside of the border called a margin. So every time we reference something called a box model, this picture is what we're thinking about. And the margin, border, padding, and then the content itself. And so you can get some interesting effects with this. And it can be sometimes a little bit complicated when you have no border at all. It gets, um, you can get a little bit uh, confused between the margin and the padding um, and which is which. But if you ever are, are thinking about which one you want to use, add a bit of border in there and see 
um, see how that's going to change how, where things interact with each other and where they're lined up um, with in, in relationship to other elements. Okay. That's going to end us for today. Um, just talking briefly about box model. We'll talk much more about how to lay things out um, with CSS. We'll, we will introduce something called um, called Flex on Monday, and that'll be our, our way of um, moving elements around the page in in various ways. So as normal, uh, I'm going to stay on for uh, for another ten minutes to answer any looming questions, and. Um, other than that, thank you very much, and I'll post the recording as soon as it's available. Right. Thank you, everyone. Um, I'll look at the chat for a couple of things for a couple of questions. Um, MDN recommends uh, REM after setting HTML to a certain pixel size. How should you pick between the two? Um, when we're sizing the actual page, uh, for example, at the HTML tag, there's a lot of different considerations we want to take there, um, uh, especially when we're looking at responsive design and whether we're addressing a mobile site or a desktop site. Um, we're not necessarily going to talk super in detail about that in, in this course. Um, so for, for our assignments here, I'd recommend just not setting the size for the HTML tag. Um, uh, but um, if you do want to look into it more, um, there's uh, something called breakpoints um, that'll that'll let you know, uh, let the browser know when to apply certain sizing um, based on how big the window is. Um, again, we're not going to get into those. Um, we're not going to test on it. We're not going to uh, look at it in assignments. So don't worry too much about it. Um, but uh, for the most part, thing we're going to size things based on percentages rather than pixels. Um, for the highlight, how do I make it start from somewhere that's not the beginning of the line? Um, it really depends on what you are trying to style and where you and, and what your goal is. Um, and, uh, so for that, I would probably look at, um, uh, is there some other element that you can introduce that, um, that is, is defining that highlighted portion of, of the, the text or the line? Um, because again, we want to have, we want to make sure our content has meaning and, and has, um, has structure around it. And so if we have some style that's just saying, uh, I'm just styling things starting from 20 pixels from the left, you can, you can do that, but then what does that mean, right? When we set margin or padding to a percentage, what is that percentage relative to? Relative to the content size? Um, Margin and padding are going to be as in relative to the parent of the element that you're setting it on. Um, it gets a little bit, th th there's some, um, some considerations there on what, um, uh, there's some differences there um, depending on what it is. Uh, for example, there's an auto keyword on margin um, that'll do some weird things, um, but for the most part, it's based on the parent of the element you set it on. And Fitz, just yeah. in that particular case, I, I'm, I'm not sure, but does the parent have to have a specific width set to it um, for, in order for that to apply? Does it keep looking for whatever element has the, the actual width or height property set to it uh, to base it off of? Yeah, so there's a couple things going on there. Um, what Once the browser uh, the browser does a bunch of work um, to figure out where things are and how big things are. Um, part of its process is to um, apply things that are explicitly defined, um, like when you set the width to 20 pixels or, or 200 pixels or whatever. But then it does another round and says, um, what is, um, for things that the width wasn't explicitly specified, 
uh, can we calculate what the width is? Um, and then we'll uh, base the subsequent children um, width and padding and box on that calculated size of the parent. And so uh, the browser does multiple passes through the DOM to figure out um, figure out the size and where things need to go. And on the second or third pass, it's going to look at um, the, the calculated width and, and whatnot. So you don't have to set the width. The browser will figure that out. Um, but if you want to be more controlling about it, uh, then you, you set the width uh, on each, each individual thing. Um, but for the most part, the browser guesses based on the size of the page.